All right, getting down to the root cause of depression. A recent study is questioning what's driving up depression rates. And one doctor says there could be a better explanation. Yeah, Dr. Austin Perlmutter is joining us now to talk more about it. And uh, doctor, thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. Thanks for having me, Tamsin and Corey. So let's talk for a moment first about depression. We know those numbers that we have seen, especially since the pandemic, have really gone up. Are they still going up at this point? Right. Well, I think it's important to start with where we were before the pandemic. And prior to COVID-19, there were already over 300 million cases of depression around the world. And when the pandemic struck, what we saw was an increase in depression, somewhere in the neighborhood of over 50 million additional cases of depression. There are a number of reasons for this, ranging from lockdown and the stress that came with that, to food changes, to exercise, to potentially infection with COVID-19 itself. And what we've seen so far is that there may be a bit of a decrease from that peak that occurred early on in the pandemic as it relates to depression. But I think it's still a little bit too early to see whether that trend holds. Interesting. Now, I know there was a recent study looking at sort of what we know about depression and mental health and specifically talks about uh, serotonin. So what did this study find? Right, so for the last 50 plus years, the dominant hypothesis or explanation for what is driving depression has centered on neurotransmitters and specifically serotonin. And this is the idea that in depression, there are issues with the brain's serotonin levels, with the serotonin activation pathways. And it helps to explain why the dominant drugs that we use to treat depression target molecules like serotonin. But for some time now, researchers have wondered whether this is actually a good explanation for what's going wrong in depression, and a number of studies have been done. And what happened last month is researchers published kind of a review of reviews, where they looked at all the different papers, the big review papers that connected serotonin and depression, and they asked a question, and that is, is there good evidence that connects serotonin, serotonin issues with depression? And their conclusion was pretty striking. It was, there's really not much there. There's not good evidence that serotonin is behind depression. Interesting. Well, is there a better explanation, though, for what could potentially be causing that at this point? That's a great question. And so, like I said, researchers have been looking into this for several decades. And I think one of the big themes that has come out of this work is that it's probably not any one thing. Uh, so it's probably not serotonin. It's probably not any individual molecule. It's probably a combination of different pathways that are occurring in the brain that may lead to a person's experience of depression. And some of the big themes in this research relate to things like changes in our brain wiring, to changes in hormones in our brain, and especially here referencing stress hormones, which are linked to uh, depression, high levels of stress hormones. And then the other one is changes in the brain's immune system. So specifically elevations in inflammation in the brain that have been linked to depression. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I, I blame Facebook. <laughs> Uh, you know, again, probably oversimplistic on my part, uh, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, the whole deal. But I mean, like, look, I, I feel like, you know, what does it mean to be happy, right? The idea of what it means to be happy today in 2022 is very different than what it meant to be happy five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 mm -hmm. years ago. How, how do you define happiness? I mean, I don't know. Am I on something or am I just crazy? It's a really good point that you make. So American adults are spending over two hours a day on their phones, uh, on social media, basically. Four hours a day watching TV, they're spending, I mean, most of your waking hours are spent interacting with media. And I think the research has been a little bit equivocal as to whether social media use, TV use, these types of things are driving an increase in depression. But what I think is clear to say is that if you're interacting with social media, with media, and it's causing a lot of stress, then that stress is not good for your body, it's not good for your brain, and it may be increasing your risk for depression. And one other thing I'll say on this front is the social comparison that is so common today on social media, which is comparing ourselves to the Joneses. Well, I'm not on vacation in Tahiti, I'm in my office right now, mm -hmm. or my house isn't quite as big as theirs. That's not so good for us either. That increases stress. And again, stress, elevations in stress over chronic periods of time have been linked to an increased risk for depression. I'd be curious to study uh, two people, like one that doesn't do anything with social and one that does and see what happens in just the course of a short week. Um, let's talk about this. You know, I know food is, is something we're going to discuss this afternoon, but inflammation is a word that we're hearing over and over these days, causing problems with your body. We certainly heard it during the pandemic with regard to uh, coronavirus. Is that part of this, too, when it comes to depression? It really does seem like it's playing a significant role. And so... 
thinking about how inflammation connects to mood is kind of an, a newer area of research. But what this research shows is that when people have issues or imbalances in their immune system, in that case, inflammation is really just an imbalance in the immune system, that it may increase their risk for developing depression. And so there's a lot of studies around this, but some of the most interesting research relates to how people feel when they're sick. And mm -hmm. I don't know about the two of you, but when I am sick, uh, I don't have the best mood. My brain is a little bit foggy. I don't have high levels of energy. Sure. And some of the reasons for that relate to what's going on in the brain and the way that the immune system is influencing the brain. So it does really seem like inflammation is connected to mood and is connected to depression. Mm -hmm. All right, so does that mean I can eat stuff that like helps with inflammation and, I, and that can help with depression, like you know, turmeric and stuff like that? That's, it's another really good question. And I want to just say one other thing about inflammation here, because a lot of listeners might be wondering, you know, do I have that issue with inflammation? Is that a problem for me? And I think it's important to understand that you can go to a lab, you can go to your doctor, get a lab marker to look at inflammation. But what research has shown is that there's a lot of other information you can get just by looking at other aspects of your health. So people with blood pressure issues, people with blood sugar issues, people with skin issues, people with weight issues, people with GI issues, all of these have been linked to elevations in inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so then the question of course is, let's say I'm worried about this and, and what foods should I choose? And you brought up a great example, which is the turmeric, right? We always hear about these anti-inflammatory foods. But I would say that the research overall shows that it's not an individual food that's so important. Rather, it's the overall quality of diet. So instead of doing some sort of a crash diet and trying to increase your anti-inflammatory foods for a month, we need to look at our overall dietary pattern. And here what we look at is the connection between food and mood and inflammation. And there's one diet that kind of stands above the rest based on the information we have, and that's the Mediterranean pattern diet. And this is a diet where you eat less processed foods. You eat more unprocessed foods. So it's kind of the exact opposite of the standard American diet, which is really rich in processed foods. And the Mediterranean diet is one where you prioritize foods like omega-3 rich foods, fish, uh, specifically cold water fish like salmon. This is an amazing way to get those omega-3s. Uh, colorful fruits and vegetables tend to be really rich in polyphenols, which have been linked to better health. Um, there's also interesting foods like Himalayan tartary buckwheat that is rich in polyphenols. Again, these plant nutrients that may be good for our overall health and our immune health. And then I really love nuts and seeds. So mm -hmm. walnuts, I think, are my overall favorite because they're rich in healthy fats, they have vitamins, they have minerals. And overall, these are the types of things that have been linked to better mood and better immune health. Yeah, no question about that. There's so much to talk about with all of it uh, and avoiding sugar as well or as much as we can. Dr. Perlmutter, good to have you with us. Thank you. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Appreciate you.